Hello, um, welcome everybody to our webinar today. Um, my name is Denise Turner. I'm Senior Lecturer in Social Work at London Metropolitan University and I also chair the advisory group for the Digital Capabilities Project. And I'm going to be doing my best to chair this webinar today. Um, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us so near Christmas. Um, we'd like to just encourage people to use the chat box throughout this webinar. Um, please enter your questions and we'll do our best to answer them as we go along. Um, and just to say who I mean by we, that is me and Ruth Allen today who are in the room and Ruth, as you will all know, is the Chief Executive Officer of Basra. Hello. Um, so, um, as I say, please send Ruth and I your questions. Just to talk a little bit about why we're having this webinar today as well, um, largely just to keep people involved and keep people interested, but also um, because we've now finished one phase of the project with our stakeholders report, which was published in October, and now we're going in very much to another phase of the project where we're looking at creating the digital capabilities framework. Um, I've had a question here, is this for children's as well as for adult social workers? Yes, it is. Yes, very much so. Um, also, just a little bit of sort of housekeeping, just to let everybody know that this webinar is being recorded. It will last about 40 to 45 minutes, and we will be joined um, by Nicola McGowan, who is Principal Social Worker for Children and Families for East Sussex. And Nicola's going to talk to us a little bit later about what they're doing in East Sussex. Unfortunately, today, we don't have Robert Walker here, who's our expert by experience. Um, but we really encourage your questions and your thoughts around involving experts by experience in this project and in the creation of digital resources. Once the webinar is finished, the slides will all be uh, copy and pasted and freely available pretty much forever in a day. So please don't panic if you, if you miss anything. Um, we, will be, we will be putting up the recording and the slides for people to catch up with. I think that's uh, going to be all from me. I'm going to hand over to Ruth. Um, and just to say once again, thank you very much for joining in. We know it's near Christmas. We know a lot of people have been ill, including me. Um, and please do use the chat box for your questions. We will answer questions as we go along, um, but we will also come back and have a question and answer session at the end too. Somebody's just asked, should we see moving talking people? Um, and the answer to that is no. Um, we are we are actually moving and talking we are, people. We are, we are real, <laughs> um, but this webinar is just sound today. Um, and to be honest, that's that's probably the best thing. Um, certainly, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so um, I'm going to hand over to Ruth Allen, who's chief executive of Baswa, um, to tell you about the project. Thank you, Denise. Yes, what you should be able to see are some slides. Um, I've got. A number of slides here to uh, accompany what I'm going to say about the project and um, we just need to uh, go through those but you we probably have more slides than we're able to to go through and you're going to get those so let's move on and uh, move on to uh, the first slide that I want to talk to so um, just just to say why we're having why we're doing this project here at all really um, this has arisen with, this, with um, it's a, an area of interest for Baswa, an area of interest obviously for Sky, it's an area of interest for social work more generally, um, and particularly uh, within also our partnership with the health uh, sector, um, all health and care professions need to develop digital skills, need to, we need to develop confidence in practice, and this project um, has had support from Health Education England and uh, NHS Digital. Uh, as part of the project that again is, a, is across uh, across professions, building a digital, digitally read, ready workforce. Social work clearly needs its own dedicated support, dedicated research guidance 
and our own approach. So it's really an opportunity uh, to, to really examine what social work needs to understand that better and, and take a really fresh look and prepare social work for the future. So um, this is the project. It was commissioned by NHS Digital and Health Education England. And our aim was to provide um, a workforce briefing, which has already been published, and I'll talk about that, uh, but also a statement of capabilities in some detail for social workers and further learning resources. So this is all about engagement. This is about working um, widely with, with all parts of social work, as we've already confirmed, um, and to think about social work in that context of, uh, of health and social care. Crucial, crucially, it's been driven by what people using services have told us about the potentials and the risks and the opportunities of digital technologies and about their expectation of the skills that they want social workers to have. So the question we're addressing is, what are the biggest digital issues for social work practice now and in the future and how do we solve them? So. Um, I just want to just draw your attention briefly to something that one of our experts by experience um, uh, has contributed to this discussion, Jordan. Um, he's a care leader advisor to the project. He's a young man who is fully using digital in his day-to-day -day life, using social, social media and so forth. And he's talked to us about how frustrating and how slightly bemusing it is that social workers seem to struggle in using digital and online technologies and about the sometimes um, uh, uh, unnecessary boundaries that get put up between using digital communications with people using services. And he's been able to um, advise us and talk to us um, alongside other people, experts by experience about what it means to, to, to use digital as a person using services and, of course, as a young person coming through and the, the importance of recognising as a profession um, the digital divide, perhaps, between uh, young, young people, children and young people coming through who've grown up um, with uh, online, uh, using online in their day-to-day -day lives and the importance of social workers being uh, fully uh, aware, fully understanding what that means to them and what that means about their expectations. But this is a project about the whole of social work, so we're also interested in um, how older people, how people with all sorts of different needs um, are using digital. So um, we, uh, we did a survey um, and uh, we had uh, 700 responses um, and they came from a wide diversity of areas of employment, local authority, independent social workers, integrated, other contexts including the uh, voluntary uh, and private sector. So we had a really good um, range of, of respondents from, from children's adults um, and, and uh, uh, children, family and adult set sectors. And what that survey um, allowed us to do, as you can see also, there's another slide here, you can see that it, we have people who were qualified uh, all sorts of different lengths of time. So their education had been very different around uh, digital uh, and uh, experiences through the training that they'd had through universities and their life experience um, of growing up or, or not being older, not growing up with digital as being um, part and parcel of life. That came through um, in the diversity of the people that we surveyed. Um, you've got some information here uh, uh, with the questions that we asked around what would a better digital technology do? And we, uh, we had a whole range of answers to this, to this question. But the key areas that people told us about were improving in integration and information sharing, enabling better communication between professionals and people using services, enabling better risk management and making uh, assessments quicker and more efficient. And the wish, I think, from social workers that digital was all about streamlining, uh, making more efficient uh, their work uh, rather than getting in the way of their work was really crucial. But one of the other key things that came through, and I'll, I'll, I'll be going through this um, a little bit more in a moment, was the importance that digital is not a replacement for the relationships and the human-to-human -human contact uh, that social work is founded on. So the, the overall ethos of this project is how does digital serve what social work and the relationships that we build with people are all about, 
rather than getting in the way of that or taking us down other um, uh, other directions and away from that, that core business. And it also came through very strongly from our experts by experience. What they don't want um, are people uh, to feel that, that we are substituting face-to-face uh, -face, uh, contact and uh, that relationship with with digital uh, uh, digital communications and dehumanizing social work. So um, one of the key areas that did come up was about how well people felt they were trained in using digital skills through their initial social work training. Um, and this was a very strong finding from our research that actually people have found social work training and given that they've trained at different time points over the last 20, 25, 30 years, um, they, overall, the finding was that they found their training, um, uh, their qualifying training, not terribly helpful in relation to digital skills. And that's something that we, uh, and Denise from the, coming from the academic sector, is very interested about, um, about how we uh, support the education sector to, to, to change that perception about the, quali about the usefulness of, of, of qualifying training. So, actually, I'm going to, I'm going to um, skip forward. You can have a look at these slides. As I said they're really a resource for you. What I'd like to do now is talk just briefly about the briefing that we've already uh, produced and the headlines that uh, uh, came out of that. So, this briefing, you said, was the first project, um, the first product from our project um, in preparation for the piece of work that we're going to produce around detailed capabilities. And this briefing, which is available on the Sky and Baswell websites, um, essentially lays out what we think are the priorities that need to happen for social workers themselves and by social workers, and then by all of the other stakeholders that are around social work that support, promote, manage, employ, set the policy for social work. I'm just going to run through those um, headlines for you. So the first thing was in terms of social workers ourselves, because I'm a social worker too, is that social oh workers, and so is Denise, <laughs> and so are lots of the people involved in our project, we should say, and including people who are, who are in direct practice as, as well as people who are supervisors and so forth. Social workers want to engage with digital technology, but they want it to enable relationship-based practice, and they want it to improve the experiences of people who use services. So maybe that state, sounds like stating the obvious, but actually it's incredibly important, because one of the things that we've, we've heard through this project is where people said, well, actually, we find digital really unhelpful, and there's that sense that we need to back away from digital in some ways, or technological solutions. And so this is about having a conversation about how do we make digital and technological um, opportunities that are undoubtedly going to emerge in the future really suitable for what we do. So social workers need to help shape policy, practice, procurement, technology, and in order to do that, social workers need to be really well informed. Managers obviously need to address training needs and, and enable people to reflect also on the ethics of digital technology. Ethics has come up again and again, and as we do further work around the capabilities, we'll really be dealing with the ethical issues. Senior managers need to ensure that social workers have great equipment, reliable Wi-Fi, connectivity, and, also, and systems that basically enable rather than hinder practice and allow integration with other systems. Again, it sounds a very obvious thing to state, but the experience of social workers is very different to that. Um, so, if you just go forward another another slide. Um, so that's some other kind of key messages um, that we found that um, social workers and experts by experience. Just go to the fourth uh, row down in this slide. Social workers and experts by experience need to be involved in the design, development, and the procurement of digital technologies. And of course, as I've also said, educators need to increase the digital skills training in qualifying courses, and also this, this has implications for what happens for CPD and that relationship between um, educators and employers and social workers about the right CPD throughout the, throughout the course of career. Um, so, and the final slide for me, 
Um, key thing is that from experts by experience who've been advising us, how does technology improve their lives, improve outcomes? How is technology rights-based? How, do, how does digital technology actually help people achieve their rights, self-determination, um, to protect their privacy and confidentiality, as well as enabling share, uh, information sharing? A few other key points, which are more at a strategic level, that tech developers need to include social workers in the, from the outset of their projects and actually build systems around practice and the needs of people using services. And that all policy affecting social work should be thinking about how we can promote uh, systems integration, and that means IT systems integration as well as people systems and organisational systems. And, all, and finally, how do leaders ensure that there's transparency around the purpose, design, procurement of systems and a particular issue that's come up, which has ethical as well as practical issues, is around AI um, and also around predictive analytics in social work. So um, these, these kind of uh, key areas, which are, can seem quite mysterious, um, the use of big data um, can seem quite mysterious and, and hard for social workers to really engage with, and yet it's going on now. Um, with artificial intelligence and um, the use of predictive analytics, so using big data to predict potential outcomes at population level and sometimes at uh, individual family level. These are new areas where social workers really uh, need to be able to engage to influence the future of all of that. So that's a whistle-stop tour of where, um, where we've got to with some of our key messages with our project. Okay, thank you very much, Ruth. Um, what I'd like to do is to encourage anyone who has a question for Ruth to type that now um, before we move on to the next bit. And I just wanted to pick up on some of the questions that people have been asking. Um, somebody said that it, it's a shame that you can't see us. Um, actually, from my point of view today, it, it isn't a shame, um, <laughs> but <laughs> I haven't been very well. But um, I wanted to explain in terms of digital capabilities why that is that you can't see us today. Um, and that's because um, if, we, if we include a sort of live video feed, it's very difficult um, for people to access that because it keeps buffering. So there is actually a reason why um, we do it like this in terms of giving people accessibility. Um, in terms of social education, I'm going to be picking up on that myself in a little bit, um, but delighted to um, see Amanda Taylor's joined us, and I know Amanda's done a lot of work around social, ed social work education. Um, and also, um, just to say that I, I realise that some people are having problems with their sound, and somebody's asked if they can access the materials afterwards. Yes, you can. They will be posted onto the Sky and Baswas sites, and they'll be available. Um, so I'm just looking at the questions that have come in. From Dave about what um, sort of yeah. Should we pick up on that one? There's one. It's a question there about what sort of digital technologies are we talking about? Um, the this project has been deliberately wide, so we are talking about everything from how we use social media or don't use it within professional contexts and how the people we work with are using social media, how we understand that, how we understand what that means to them, through to technologies that might support people kind of physically um, and how, uh, how those are developing in, in social care, through to the types of technological systems that people have to use for recording um, and other, other functions at work, and also things like how people know whether or not social workers can access and use data sources, big data, and whether people have training in, in understanding how to use um, uh, 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 data sources that, that, that are available digitally to run reports or make, um, to, do, to do research or audit. So we've taken a very broad view of mm. digital technology um, and, and really looked at, to see how these things interrelate so, and, and to understand where social workers perhaps are gaining more knowledge in the areas where there's particularly wide, wide gaps. And I think for me, um, Dave, your, your question is a, is a key question and it is something that we spent quite a long time talking about at the beginning of the advisory group um, in the project. 
basically what do we mean by digital mm. and people mean mm. very very different things mm. and that's certainly something that's come into our discussion of social work education as well as as Ruth said people are trained at different times um, and in different ways so so what is meant by digital I think is is a, a whole um, question in itself but we, we do offer a definition of it on the project website um, so but again I think that's a really good question and, and something for us to come back to in terms of, of what you know some people are talking about AI some people are literally talking about being able to do a table on word so um, so these capabilities are very broad and the projects taken a deliberately broad view of them Somebody else has asked, Ruth, is Social Work England involved in the project? Yes, so we have an advisory group which Denise chairs. Um, Social Work England um, are part of that. They um, have been to some uh, of our meetings um, and have linked with us um, around this. There is, I think, uh, an ongoing dialogue really to be had with the regulator about what we find is going to mean and what that means for regulation and um, how Social Work England develops their expectations around uh, digital capabilities as part of the, of the professional education standards going forward. So it's an ongoing discussion. And a really important one because um, obviously any digital capabilities framework is going to need to be embedded um, and Social Work England are going to need to be part of that. So. Um, I'm just looking at the questions that have come in. I think we've answered all of them now. Um, yes, the, the slides, as we've said, the slides will be available. So um, I think then, Ruth, we can move on, can't we? Yeah. Um, and I think uh, I'm going to move on just to pick up on some of the points that you made about social work education, which, as you showed in the slides, has. Um, has, has come out in in the um, the stakeholders report quite strongly as having things that it needs to address. Um, do you want to? Um, okay. No. Yes. <laughs> All right. Change of plan. Um, so actually, what we're going to do is we're going to bring in Nicola um, McGowan, who is principal social worker for children and families for East Sussex County Council and um, Nicola's just going to say a little bit about all the work that they're doing in East Sussex in terms of um, digitally enabling practitioners and families that they're working with. Hi, my name's Nicola McGowan. I'm the Principal Social Worker at East Sussex Children's Services. I'm just going to give you a brief synopsis about the stuff that we've been doing in East Sussex. Um, just like everybody else, we've been really grappling with technology with the risks it poses as well as stuff we can embrace. We've been dealing with this really for the last uh, five or six years. Um, this started off really with me having an interest and then I, I had a PA that was really techie um, and I created a post for her so that she sat next to me and is my digital manager um, and she liaises, helps me liaise with our IT and D department. We have a really strong working relationship with them the um, and I meet with them regularly to talk about for example the rollout of devices so um, a lesson learned is not to assume that people know how to use technology so we're just refreshing our um, tablets our, our laptops our iPhones and using our digital practice leads who we've got right across the service we're doing a whole series of DG hacks which is on video and screenshots, they can make sure that people get the most out of their devices in terms of the direct work that they do with children, but also some real um, saving, time saving things that they are doing. Um, we started off really looking at using social media, for example, when I developed our blog. And what we do is we interview um, social workers. We've got a timetable of interviewing social workers, comms do this for us, talking about the best way, top tips to deal with resistance, top tips to um, survive your first year of social work, um, blogs like that. And then I've got quite, uh, I've got um, a large following group, or not large, but I've got a following group that's more than two people. And I um, tweet that. 
Um, and it was through the blog that we launched our single source website, which we use, which is an internal website, and it's designed in a way that we think is really accessible. And it has our practice research and tool kits on there. One of our toolkits is a digital toolkit, um, and that talks about different apps um, that we have on our phones, but also different websites people can use. That's structured around engagement, assessment, and interventions. Um, we also have created, through the digital practice leads who are set across the service, our own how to do a digital assessment using the uh, children's assessment framework, and then laying over the top of that very specific questions about what to, how to explore how families are using technology, how young people are using technology, how they keep themselves safe or not safe and some tools to help you make sense of that information and, and look at the risk. We then have developed also our own digital resource toolkit, which has how to set up parental controls, um, information about the Internet of Things, information about gaming, information about different websites where you can keep yourself up to date about the latest technology and the latest apps. The message we get across to practitioners is we definitely don't expect you to keep to know all this information off the top of your head, but you need to know how to find out about information. Um, and that's been a success. Sadly, we've had to actually print off flashy um, hard copies of those documents because we find that having them in people's offices sitting on their desks is when they most effectively use them. We have digital practice leads across the service um, who are particularly into technology. We've been using those same leads for about three or four years. Um, and they do a series of lunchtime seminars looking at such things as social media and contact, looking at gaming, looking at digital professionalism, looking at online grooming, um, all of those different areas, and also how to embrace technology in a positive way. Um, and then we have our annual conference where we have a keynote spe speaker this year. It's, we're going, we're going, delighted to have Dr. Peter Buzzy talking. Um, and um, we get really good attendance through that. Um, our, we're currently creating our, we're currently piloting using um, WhatsApp and Facebook direct messenger in our care leaving service um, in terms of communicating directly with them. It's a minefield, but we're doing it incrementally. We're getting loads of IT and D support. We're creating guidance as we go along. And that's a really, really exciting um, field for us. We're pulling all of this together into our social media guidance, looking at issues around lack, accessing um, social media as for safeguarding concerns. Um, but again, we're doing lots of consultation, getting lots of legal advice. Um, and that's just in draft form at the minute. OK, thanks. Bye. OK, thank you very much. Um, it's great to hear from Nicola about what they're doing in East Sussex. Um, and again, if anybody's got any questions about that, please do uh, use the chat the chat box. Ruth, I know there was something you just wanted to pick up on. Yeah, just to say that um, so Nicola and East Sussex, that was a, a, a great practice example that came through with our call for good practice examples. And there are others that you can read about in the um, stakeholder report. Um, and what was really interesting, I think, um, working, um, hearing from Nicola, is about the whole system culture change with making these interconnections between social media, um, basic training, getting social workers involved in, in how digital might develop in the future, the hardware, the software. It was that kind of interconnectivity of engaging um, people at all levels in the organisation with this uh, intention of improving a digital kind of competence at a systems and, and organisational level as well as at the individual level. Um, and it also points to uh, a, a key area of, of further development in our project, which is about developing local champions. Nicola and, her and some of her colleagues have become real uh, local champions. And we're looking at how we can develop networks of local champions. Um, and also we're looking at how we can develop national champions. Um, and there'll be more about that that will come through in the later stages of the project. And JJ, I see you've asked a question about what ethical hurdles are most challenging. 
Um, Nicola isn't actually with us today, so um, she can't answer that question directly. But certainly as far as our work in the project and the advisory group is concerned, um, ethics is something that we're still developing and we're still working on and, and, and very, very conscious of, obviously, because this is one of the things that can discourage social workers from, from engaging with digital technology. Yeah, I think there's, there's um, where we're looking, uh, we we're going to do a particular piece around ethical guidance, and that will be one of the um, later products in, in the spring as part of our project, and that will cover the wi these wide issues of ethics for social workers. Um, so that will be about not only not only what happens in practice, because we also think people need specific practice guidance about decision making that is informed by or uses um, or is impacted by um, digital technologies um, uh, uh, in various ways. Um, but also there's wider issues um, about things like you know, types of information sharing, the use of big data, mm -hmm. the collection of data and how it's used. Um, all of those things will be uh, looked at in um, in that in that later guidance. And I suppose also uh, what Nicola's told us about also returns us to the earlier question about what do we mean by digital capabilities? And she's talked there, uh, given a lot of different examples in terms of big data, but also using things like blogs, social media, digital toolkits. So again, um, one of the things that we've looked at very much in the project is 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 all these different resources and how do we bring them all together for, for that culture change that, that Ruth's been talking about. Do you want to answer that question from Lauren? Yeah, um, yes, there's a couple of questions there actually. I'll, I'll yeah. mention the one from Lauren asking about how can technology companies get involved in the next phase. So we would be really interested to hear from any technology companies um, that are working on um, either currently or thinking about working in this in the field of, of health and social care, things that impact on social work. We have already engaged with some technology companies that are working in this space um, and be very interested to hear about innovations in this area. The numbers, um, most local authorities use a very limited, there's a very limited number of uh, technology solutions uh, systems that they that they procure and use. It's a fairly small market and a lot of them are perhaps systems that have been around for a long time and aren't necessarily based on the most advanced ways of uh, that we now have um, of using technology, of capturing information in the most efficient ways. Really interested in any innovations that might be coming through um, and how to make technology that people use day to day really fit with the purpose of social work. Um, and that kind of reflecting that relational work that social workers do. Um, there's also a question there about if this research is looking at England only. And so this is a, um, so thank you Catherine for that, also asking whether or not we will be, this is about Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland as well. So Sky and Baz were both UK wide organisations. So this project is commissioned to, to uh, for England to look at the England system, and so that's where we're doing our field work. Um, but actually, we're very aware that these are much; these are issues that affect social work, uh, certainly across the UK and more broadly than that. So we will think we are thinking as organisations about how we can share this um, with our colleagues across the UK and link in with with projects that may be happening there. And I think we're also very aware, aren't we, Ruth, that any any work in this area is always going to, to be the tip of the iceberg to some extent, and also because this area is changing so rapidly that even while we're looking at it, things are, ch are changing yeah. as yeah. we go along, and that's one of the that's problems. Right. Um, and so I see somebody's just typed that, actually, that the, the pace of tech mm -hmm. um, in LA's can be slow, um, but actually the pace of tech nationally um, and internationally is very very rapid so it's it can be a, a problem with any definitions or anything that we're talking about to keep up with that mm -hmm. as well. Um, there's a question there Ruth about any practical tools for practitioners to have productive conversations with leaders about new tech. That's a really good question. These are all really good questions yes. actually so thank you for them. They're, they're giving us as much as we're, we're giving yes. you. Um, um, they, I think that really points to what we would hope to include, or what we will include in the capabilities actually, is to support social workers to have confidence to have those 
conversations with leaders. So I have some practical guidance um, for social workers in practice and then also for practice leaders about facilitating those conversations and actually listening closely to what practitioners who are doing direct work are saying about their experience of technology in the workplace and, and how well um, tech and, and digital um, uh, digital platforms and so forth are working for them and working for people they serve. So that's a really helpful um, a really helpful question, something that we need to um, address, I think, is enabling practitioners to have those conversations in, in ways that influence um, decisions that are made by seniors and, and tech, uh, tech leads and so forth. Yeah. And I suppose that links to the question about um, level of investment in this area. I mean, certainly I would say from, from being involved in the project that this area has become a priority in terms of um, interest, um, in investment financially, um, maybe another maybe another conversation. But I think that what people are starting to look at actually is, is how digital capabilities can help um, with cost efficiency as, as well as workforce efficiency. Yes, I think um, yes, it's actually uh, one of the things we've picked up on is the fact that if if practitioners and people who are going to be using technologies and the ultimate recipients of support through people using services are not involved in decisions about what to you know what to procure, how to roll it out, how to develop it further, then you actually get waste in the system that okay. way. Um, with, with there are some particular examples of that where expensive systems have been brought in to do new things in technology um, that look very um, exciting and then they've actually been uh, abandoned because they're not serving perhaps a need. So, so there's, this isn't really, our, our work isn't about whether this is more or less cost effective per se, but in, in, as we all have to think about good use of resources mm -hmm. and not wasting resources, we are thinking about, just, just as a bit of a side issue, we are thinking about the ethics in relation to um, the uh, environmental impact of um, hardware and different types of, types of technology and some of the component parts. So I just thought I'd mention that, although it's not, it's not, you know, we're, we're, we are moving forward because we think there's a, there's a huge inevitable um, uh, momentum in the development of new technologies, but we also have to think about um, the ethical issues uh, that come from from that side of things as well. Just in terms of of the um, the actual materials, um, people think that it's necessarily greener to go to go online with everything, um, but there's there's huge embedded um, environment and uh, energy costs. So we're not we are aware of those issues, even though they're not they're not sort of absolutely central to why this project was set up. Absolutely, and there was a piece of work done last week which I saw about the environmental cost of sending emails, yeah. actually, which may be music to a lot of people's ears <laughs> um, in, in terms of reducing email. Mm. Um, so uh, I see people are having quite a lot of conversations here, which is, is useful. There was a, a question that's, that was raised that we haven't had an opportunity to answer that was about having a feel for the levels of capability in terms of the... Um, HEE, Digital Capabilities Framework, have mm. we got a feel of, of what the levels of capability are? And I think we do. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I think, I, think that's, I think that's emerging. Um, I think when we do the piece of work on the digital capabilities, we will be looking at that guidance and ensuring um, that we are... I'll just say a little bit about how we're going to develop those digital capabilities. Actually, I think that might be quite helpful. We are going to use um, the framework of the professional capabilities framework for social work and paying attention to the knowledge and skills statements for adults and children um, and also the regulatory standards. And we're going to structure the capability statement um, around the capability statements that BAS has been uh, developing for post-qualifying uh, post um, uh, uh, work uh, in, in, in the fields of learning disability, um, autism and older people. Actually, we're going to use that kind of framework. And that is led by the PCF, um, but referencing those other standards and brings them together. And then we will also be mapping that onto the Health Education England Building a Digitally Ready Workforce um, uh, domains that were referenced in the question. Um, and we, uh, we will also be, it will be in dialogue with HEE about whether their multi-professional guidance actually needs to 
change, uh, this, this is a dialogue, there's no decisions about this, about whether that, because it's for health and care professions, so it should also work for social work, and it may be that there are some tweaks, amendments, you know, additional pieces that need to go into that multi-professional guidance that really makes it very relevant for social workers as well. So it'll be something very specifically for social workers and then something that also makes the multi-professional guidance work. And when we've done that work, I think we'll be able to answer that question okay. <laughs> more, more effectively um, about how um, about just how, uh, how, how where the gaps are in relation to those domains at the moment. And here's an easy question that's just come in, which from Richard, which is just saying, is your call for practice example still open? And the answer is yes, it is. Yes, we're very interested in any um, practice examples that help to just... That we, we, we actually had a, a lot of uh, short uh, descriptions of great practice um, in the survey, in fact. Um, but we could really do with some more worked up practice examples and to collect those up. So please do send, send them through. And I think as Ruth emphasised, this is very much a conversation and it's it's an ongoing one. Nothing nothing is set in stone at this point. And Brian, just to say that we've noted your very interesting point about um, your PhD and the work that you're doing. Um, I'm going to move us on because I am aware of time. Um, I was just going to say a, a, a very little bit that picks up on what Ruth talked about in terms of social work education and also um, partly picks up on what Nicola was talking about too. One of the things that came across to me in, in Nicola's piece was um, that, that they had to produce hard copies um, of their digital um, assessments for social workers to have on their desks. And that also um, she made the point very strongly that you can't assume that people know how to use IT. And that's something that came up very much in the survey for the project was, um, as you saw from Ruth's slides, um, there was very, very, um, a lot of work to be done in universities and, and higher ed education institutes and um, a lot of respondents to the project survey reported, unfortunately, um, from my point of view, because I'm a social work educator, that their social work training didn't prepare them for um, digital readiness in practice. And this is something that um, we very much want to be working on. And for me, I think that, um, again, it brings us back to that question about what do we mean by digital? Um, because sometimes these digital capabilities are very small things, like knowing how to turn on track changes so that you can see your feedback, um, knowing how to make a table in Word, and I very recently had an experience where one of the students that I'm a placement tutor for was risking being failed on her placement because um, of her lack of digital capability. And for me, that's it's very much um, my, my duty and our duty as social work educators to be helping students um, to be developing these digital capabilities so that they're then taking them forward into practice. Um, and just to pick up on another point that's been made, I, for myself, I don't think that digital has to replace relational. I think they're complementary, and I think it's important that um, we emphasise that message at an education level as well, that it's not a binary. And certainly in thinking about the experts by experience that have been involved with, with the project, one of the things that they've talked about is... Um, getting involved in social work education, which they already are, mm -hmm. um, but very much taking um, a digital angle to that. So how can experts by experience, for example, with specific needs, um, become involved with training students around what technologies are useful for them? For example, um, maybe communication aids for people with learning disabilities or for people diagnosed with dementia. So again, that's something that um, we're going to be looking at in the project, and there are very clear implications for social work education, um, so that we're working together to, to turn out social workers that are practice ready. So um, just looking again, that's, that's, that's a bit about social work education. Um, 
looking back to the questions that we've been asked, have we commissioned a survey to identify key areas? Yes. Yes, we did. <laughs> yes, that was the main. We did a main survey, um, and we also had um, workshops um, and and call outs for for um, further feed in. And the call out call out for practice was also um, a part of gathering information about what what is working, what isn't working. But we did a we did a survey. There was about seven hundred um, respondents to that with that diversity that I presented briefly earlier. And that has allowed us, I think, to get a real feel for four key areas um, that, that need to be addressed. And we asked lots of questions about the types of practice development or professional development that would be most useful to people. Um, and we'll be doing more of that as we build um, the full capabilities guidance uh, over, the, over the next few months. So we'll be uh, coming back out to people to, to interrogate some of those um, things that have been uh, stated or implied by by the survey and interrogate that in a bit more detail. There's a question there um, also about where does data security feature in the debate. I guess this is about um, all or I guess that all types of uh, security, privacy, um, data sharing uh, between organisations, um, all of those things are key they're key practical issues and they're also key ethical issues mm -hmm. that we've talked about a lot it's interesting to have it raised here as a question um gabby if there's something specific that you're thinking about in relation to data security um do do let us know um we obviously know that um there's uh, there's obviously the risk of hacking and the mm -hmm. risk of have a of public authorities and other organisations having systems that are not sufficiently secure and the fact that um, the, uh, illegal, mine, uh, illegal hacking and, and, and accessing data does happen and we're all at risk of that um, and also having um, organisations having you know absolutely state-of-the-art ways of protecting people's data is really crucial and as we collect more and more and more data um, that becomes uh, an even greater area of, uh, of risk. So that is definitely part of part of the debate. And we've also talked about simple things like making sure that what is used is GDPR compliant, for example. And Nicola again talked in, in her piece about using WhatsApp um, and describing it as a minefield because, yeah. um, again, using these... Um, resources can also then have a lot of ethical knock-on effects. So those are all the sort of things that we're thinking about. I think the challenge for the project and the, the challenge for, for all of us, um, or one of the challenges certainly, is that one of the reasons perhaps that, that social work has been a bit slow to engage with some of these things is because um, the emphasis has tended to be on harm for good reason. Mm. Um, and and um, because people have been very concerned about, about mm. these issues, which is quite right. Um, but to some extent um, in the project, we're also trying to look at what the opportunities are as well. So, um, so it's, it's a very fine balance between, yeah. between looking at what are the opportunities of, um, and advantages of using these digital technologies, these different ways of communicating and capturing data, but also making sure that in doing that, we're safe. Um, and we're keeping people's data safe. Yes, I think I was I was thinking about one uh, mentioning as well that clearly we're very aware of the safeguarding issues that arise um, through um, that arise often online, often in sort of social media type platforms, um, and this particularly uh, perhaps affects children, but actually affects adults as well. Um, and understanding that environment that people are effectively inhabiting, virtually inhabiting, um, on a day-to-day -day basis is absolutely crucial for social work now. It's like understanding that the meaning of that, the, the way in which uh, people of all ages actually are involved with online communities, online connections, online, uh, and, what they're, and what people may be exposed to in that context is really crucial. Um, and so that is definitely part of um, part of the consideration, and, and as Denise, as you were saying, that balance between understanding the reality of risks that arise from that and how we are alert to that as social workers, balancing that with 
the opportunities, which includes the opportunities of, of very functional kinds of support online, uh, lots of things online, online resources that people have found very helpful, is, is really important. But it, it's, it's a little bit like going into, I mean, like going into a library, and that library is full of books, some of which could do you some harm yeah. if you were, you know, or, or going into any, and some of which would do you great, great good, or going into any kind of community, um, a, a, a non-virtual, a real-world community, mm -hmm. where there are harms and there are there are benefits for be, of developing more connectivity, you know, building new relationships, and how does that play out in the online world, and what is what is um, what what is kind of different in the nature of online risks compared, compared to the um, risks within. Um, uh, the real world, as it will. So we're very aware of all of that, and that will will need to feature strongly um, within within the capabilities. It's the balance that social workers do. You know, it's what we do all the time. We balance risk with opportunity, and how does that play out in the digital world? Is it's kind of a question that we're answering. And I think that um, one of the the points that's come over very clearly from Jordan, whose photo uh, Ruth showed earlier in her slides, who's been advising advising the advisory group and is a member of our advisory group is is that point about not um, he's 16 he doesn't make a distinction between the online world and you know what yeah. what myself of a certain age might call the real world um, that distinction isn't there so I think that's that's yeah. it's a very important point for us to embrace um, as I said, we were due to have um, Robert Walker who is also on our advisory group one of the experts by experience. Um, unfortunately, Robert wasn't able to make it today, um, but I just wanted to, to emphasise some of the points that he was going to make, um, and I want to do that uh, quickly because we're, we're almost time now. So just to say that, that, that some of the key messages that came out of the work that's already been done um, in terms of experts by experience were the importance of co-production. Um, experts by experience were very, very enthusiastic about the advantages and the benefits of digital technologies. Um, but I think it's fair to say that one of their main points is that they want to be involved with the development of these. They want, as Ruth said earlier, to make sure that there isn't money wasted developing resources that actually aren't realistic for them in, um, in practice and, and on the ground. Um, and they also very clearly want to be involved in the training of social workers. Mm. So, mm. so in thinking about social workers' digital capabilities when they're students and looking at their teaching and assessment of students' digital readiness as they come out into practice. Um, and very much a demand for um, transparency around some of the issues that we've already discussed today. So things like, what are we procuring? Um, why are we procuring it and, and who from and also what are the ethical um, issues around that so very much things that we've talked about today um, and I, I haven't done justice to what Robert would have said but um, I hope that summarised some of the points around experts by experience so we have about another five minutes um, before we finish, and um, I'd certainly really like to thank everybody for that for all the questions that are coming in. Um, we've got a question here in in terms of capabilities. Do we have to prepare social workers to educate service users or clients in regard to clients' digital safety, um, especially if we start using more tech? Um, mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question, Paul. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it is it is a very pertinent question. Um, and I think that's right. I think if we're doing, if we're having a co-production and collaborative, involving approach to developing our technology, in a sense that should always involve having ongoing conversations with people who are going to be ultimate recipients about changes that we might want, that we might be making within our practice or within our organisations, and actually about how that is going to affect uh, people. And actually, is it welcome? Can it? Is it co-designed with them? Um, and where we are introducing something that in, a, in a way that might be driven by an organisational imperative, um, maybe because we think it's going to enable us to do something more quickly, um, how do we uh, ideally do that co-productively, and then how do we absolutely let people, um, as you use the term educate, how do we inform, educate people 
um, about the implications of that. And in terms of digital safety in particular, I think there's so much more that we can we can do. I think we're we're often be picking up the pieces because we haven't had an early maybe we or others in the system haven't had early conversations with people about what about how to engage um, with 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 digital um, technologies. That can be everything from online fraud that might affect people of any age, from banking fraud, through to um, Set, uh, risks of sexual or other kinds of exploitation online um, and who is having those conversations with people about being safe um, in, in, the, in the digital world and what's the role of social workers and what's the role of other people um, in, in the kind of system um, to, to, to support that safety. There's quite a few questions coming in now, aren't there? A lot um, of the questions are around age, mm, I think. There seems mm. to be two strands to that from, from what I can see. One of the questions is around mm. um, the age of social workers and practitioners themselves mm. and um, are, may, might they be more reluctant to engage? Um, and the other question is around older adults who, who may not be aware of technology. Mm. Um, and I, I don't think there's been any specific work. Has there really been drilling down into the age of, of the workforce? Um, so we have we have details from our survey about that we can cross-reference about the different kinds of responses according to the age of the workforce. I think one of the things that's been found in other pieces of research, we obviously did a, a literature and research review, is we also have to be careful not to make assumptions that because, for instance, young, you have younger members of the workforce, that they will necessarily be any more savvy um, or aware or knowledgeable about how to use the, the specific ways in which we need to use technology in, in professional practice. So there was um, a strong sense from the survey that people feel in their personal lives very well informed and, and very skilled in using technologies, but that doesn't necessarily translate into um, being very confident or knowledgeable about how to use um, technologies, digital platforms, you know, knowing how to manage their interface with social media, for instance, in a professional context. Um, so, so there are, there, I think there probably, there are age issues, there are, you know, there are generational issues, if you like, but they're not, it's not just straightforward, it's not just a, a straight linear thing. Um, we should. One of the things that has come through and been said in a number of different forums is make no assumptions. With you know, if you're if you're in a team, if you're managing a team, if you're managing an organisation, whatever, don't make any assumptions about everybody's technological skill. Just because they they're, they're very active on Facebook in their personal life doesn't mean that they're going to know how to use a particular kinds of technologies and, and um, make the decisions they need to make. Um, ethical decisions in and the I think that's something that I would very much like to stress as well and I see Amanda you've just um, also endorsed what Ruth's been saying that actually personal capabilities don't necessarily translate into the professional sphere absolutely and I've certainly come across um, you know young people as, as young as 16 who are incredibly digitally competent in many many ways but for example wouldn't be able to use track changes um, because <laughs> it's, it's not something that that they've ever had to do before. So so that's absolutely right and we can't make those assumptions. I think it's very important. Yeah. Um, that's a very important point. So um, Nicholas just made a point that um, if if local authorities decide to introduce a citizen portal, mm -hmm. um, then social workers may need to, to play a role in encouraging the use of this technology. Absolutely. And I think that's one of the things again that the project's very much been identifying what are the different roles and responsibilities likely to be. Just picking up, uh, Ben has, has mentioned the fact that um, it's a shame that Nicola couldn't talk more about, I uh, wasn't available to talk about some of the resources that East Sussex has developed. And we would just like to say um, that we, we are aware that there are um, there are lots of orga individual organisations and others who are and other other people who are researching and developing practice in this area to really think about how social workers um, particularly can uh, support online safety. So thanks for that. And, and obviously we we're very aware that our work sits in a context of lots of people actually now becoming increasingly uh, concerned and wanting to get involved and improve practice advice and so on. Okay, so I'm very aware that we need to, we need to wrap this up, and I think that um, I'd just like to um, 
finish by thanking everybody very much. I know we've gone on for a little bit longer than I said we would at the beginning, but that's partly been because of the level of questions that have come in, and thank you very much for those. I think it, I'd like just to close partly by picking up on Alicia's point about older people as well, and just to not forget in all the conversations that we're having um, the issue of digital exclusion. Um, there is still mm. quite a high, reasonably high percentage of people in the country that actually have never been on the internet or that are digitally excluded in whatever way. So mm, yes. um, it is something important to hang on to when we're talking about capabilities yeah. as well. Um, and just to say thank you very much indeed for ev everyone for joining in and for all your questions. As we've said, all these materials will be made available to you. Thank you very much. Thank you.